Rusty Knuckles, the Hockey Outlaws Podcast, with your hosts, Terry Nasty Sotomayor and former Philadelphia Flyer Enforcer, Riley Cote, as they go behind the scenes with your favorite NHL players. This week's guest is former Philadelphia Flyer and one tough son of a bitch, Josh Bratton. Time to face off. All right, welcome back to another episode of Nasty Knuckles. What is going on, Nasty? What's up, Regs? How you doing, brother? Doing well, brother. Looking uh, good in that sweet ass jersey you're rocking. Whoa. There. What this whole thing? <laughs> oh, thing's fresh off the it press. Was- 44 yeah. oh yeah you know not bad it could be available here soon yeah for exactly. everyone beauty you rock it well thanks brother yeah well how about them like flyers it. what's going on with them well they lost three or four here uh i didn't expect uh them dropping two two or three to pit to be honest with you i mean you never know it's the nhl anything can happen but uh you know, then they, they had a tough one last night. I don't, I don't know really what's going on. They lost, Like I said, they lost three or four. Um, they do have some games at hand. I, I think tomorrow night they're, they're very happy to see Buffalo coming in. Yeah. Um, not, not, the, not the crap on Buffalo, but they're just, they just look like a team that doesn't even want to play hockey to me. And I've never played the game, as we know, but they just look disinterested to me. So hopefully that gets the... Boys get a big win tomorrow and uh, get the ball rolling the right way again. Yeah, no doubt. Well, the worst thing it can do is take Buffalo lightly. You know, they, they, they seem to yeah. be a little bit of a fragile team right now, but, um, you know, you, you can't underestimate them. They have a good night and you have a bad night, and then all of a sudden it's a different story. So they got to somehow get back on the uh, you know the right track. I just feel like there's holes in their game. They're just uh, – there's just – there's, uh, you know, too many gaps with their defensemen, um, you know, some sloppy plays. Um, I don't know. There's just, uh, there's like inc- inconsistencies, especially yesterday's game, you know. When first period was great, and then all of a sudden, they weren't even exactly trading chances. They were just giving, you know, Washington, specifically Ovechkin, <laughs> you know, three or four chances there, which is is not a good thing, obviously, and then eventually capitalizes. I don't know. There just seems to be a disconnect Um I say maybe on the defense a little bit more. If, if some of these pl- the forwards are not really contributing enough, in my opinion, I think there's a few holes there. You know, I don't know what your what your thoughts yeah. are there, but um, it certainly need I, to be better all around. Yeah, I, I think they can be, and you know, yeah. you know how it is too. I mean, sometimes this is a way different time than normal. Uh, obviously, with the COVID and everything, the way way things have gone, but you know, sometimes you get into a little bit of a lull. I don't think there should be one right now. Obviously, it's uh, you're only to what 20, 22, 20, 23 games in, but uh, I think they'll be. I still I'm sticking by what I've said yeah. from the get go. I just think they're too good of a team. I you know teams do go through little funks, and uh, hopefully that last week was just that, and they can get back um, get back in the win column tomorrow. And like you said, you can't take anyone lightly in this league. Um, it. I, you know, Buffalo's coming in, and you've got Taylor Hall, who you signed, I think, to $5 million. You, you got Skinner on the books for nine mil, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, you got your captain, uh, Jack Eichel. Those guys get hot. Now you got to look out, you know, but they just can't seem to get hot at all. I think they've got three goals between the three of them, and I, that could be the wrong stat, but I'm pretty sure that's what I read. Uh, anyway, so hopefully they get a big win tomorrow. And, and like you said, I, I, I just – there, it seems like there's a lot of sh- uh, switching of D partners, a lot of switching of the lines, and I know guys were sick, so it did kind of, uh, you know, throw a curveball. Obviously, at your at the coaches and what they need to do, but uh, on the the D side of things, it it seems like they're switching every night. It's a different six, yeah. you know, and I know it's only usually one, but it still probably throws one guy off that was playing with. Say Robert Haig, you were playing with him. Well, now he's out of the lineup. Last night, Gustafson came in and he hadn't played in a while. Um, I don't know. I'm no coach. I'm no GM. I just wonder if that has anything to do with it. Um, you know, just not being able to get comfortable with with people you're playing with. So yeah. maybe that's it. 
Yeah, you know, it's uh, there, there's. I, I think there's even more more there to than than just that. I, I do agree with you. I think, but there's. I think there's a couple guys that just need to be better, and you know, the chemistry, just the uh, just the lack of defending at times. Uh, you know, I go back to the, the first Pick, Pittsburgh game. It was like an emotional game, right? I mean, it's uh, yeah. the first time they played Pittsburgh since Friedman had been traded there. I think there was some like you know some extra juice there, and, and you know, give give yeah. Freed some. Some credit, you know, he definitely uh, he played hard and you know draw drew some penalties there and you know and he was effective. I think both those two games that he played, um, you know, I think that first game the Flyers put up like thirty seven shots, which was more than enough shots to, to win the game. But um, right. again, just a, a little loose there, um, and then you know Pittsburgh capitalizing on their opportunities, but. Um, you know, and then the, the, the game they win, the second game, you know, G, G's the hero. It's nice to see G score a couple goals. Yeah. Um, you really know, be, nice. a, be a leader there. But I just feel like the, 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 to say the maybe his surrounding cast, um, you know, there's just not enough juice and not consistent juice. You know, JVR seems to be going. Faraby seems to be going. Um, a couple of these guys are a little bit hot and cold. TK, in my opinion, he, he needs to be better. You say Jake. I mean, a couple of these guys just need a little bit more juice from, you know, some of these more vet, veteran guys. Um, that's just my opinion. What I see, you know, again, you go and then you go play Washington, and you got Ovi flying around. And I mean, he you can't let that guy get. I don't know how many shots he finished with. It, it was at least eight. He was probably in the, you know, in the in, in the in the Baker's dozen there when it was all said and done. Yeah. But you know, um, I don't know. It, it, they just need to just tighten tighten up and find some consistency. I know they got some, you know some younger defense, but I do like Ghost's game for the most part. The last few games, he's he seems to be more involved and you know making some crisp plays, but you know, that being said, there's still some some disconnect on the defending uh, portion of it. But we'll see. You know, Buffalo comes in; they gotta have a big game. That's just the bottom line. You can't, you cannot drop that game. You cannot. There's no, no there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. So we'll see how that goes, and uh, you know, we'll uh, yeah. we'll recap uh, this next week. Um, next week. So, um, but uh, moving on, to the rest of the NHL. Um, you know, a couple of highlight real goals with Barzell and, and, and a couple Ooh. other beauties, um, no question. But uh, what I wanted to talk about was a couple of these hits. You know, you talk about Tom Wilson, he gets seven-game suspension, which, in my opinion, he deserved. I mean, he he's a repeat yeah. offender, I think five suspensions you would mentioned before we got on, and two, and, and two fines in the last how many years. Um, but that was a blatant headshot, right? I mean, he deserved that. I mean, and he's, and he's notorious – doing that type of thing so um i think the nhl made the right call uh what do you yeah, think yeah i do i do on that one i i like don't get me wrong man i love tom wilson's game me too me too you you have to you you're looking for him if you're playing d you're playing forward he's kind of like what we talked about zach ronaldo when we talked to reno he he can hit that hit is obviously a hit you don't want to see yeah on anyone but he's a physical guy. He answers the bell. Yeah. Um, he, he ended up fighting uh, Tenorti the other night. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and Frederick. But, yeah, yeah. And but, but I just feel like that hit, he didn't have – it looked like he didn't even hit any of his body. It looked yeah. like he just hit his head. And I feel like he came from far enough away that he could have either lowered himself or – and, again, I didn't play. I can't even imagine what – the speed you guys play – Played at, play at now. Um, it's got to be tough, but that one was, I, I think, deserved. Yeah. Um, and then, then you had the Connor Murphy hit yesterday, which I just feel like that's a good hit. I mean, that's I don't even know. You're gonna find I don't even know. Game, yeah. In my I, I don't even know if he hit him in the face. To be I honest, from so. the one angle, it looks like he did, but when they show from the opposite, it looks like he hits him right in the chest. And I know his body comes up, but I mean it. That's, that's I don't natural. think he definitely didn't headhunt him. No, there was no headhunting, um, and, and yeah, and it, it wasn't a deliberate. If even if it did touch his f- face, I don't think I still don't think it did. I mean, that was as clean as you're going to find in today's game. Um, yeah. Tom Wilson's was just unnecessary. You know, what I mean, he could have just r- rubbed that guy out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And had no, no, no he issues at all. Puck, yeah, he could have. Yeah, no, he I know. Gotten the puck. And yeah. he's a good player too, Tom. He really Tom, is. Tom Wilson's a good hockey player. Yeah, he's the X factor um, for sure. You know, uh, but. Back back to uh, Connor uh, Murph. I, I feel like some of the some of the issue is 
this guy's skating behind the net with his head down yeah. with the puck. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I know people are going to say, well, he's a defenseless player. Well, he's defl- defenseless because he's not looking. He's yeah. not, he doesn't have his head up, which you're taught as a kid. You know that. Um, you come flying around the net like that. I mean, yeah. you know, it wasn't the Steve Downey hit on in Ottawa his rookie year where uh, Dean McCammon, he <laughs> damn near decapitated Dean McCammon, and it was a late hit. This was, the, to me, it looked like a hockey hit and a clean hit. Yeah. I don't think he left. Some I read, some someone said, "Oh, he left his feet." I didn't think he left his feet. I could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I think but I don't was... think that deserves a, a suspension. And I'm not sure what ended up happening there, if if something did or not. But uh, I don't think anything's happened yet. Yeah, no, I, I think. I mean, yeah. again, it's, that's a clean hockey play, in my opinion. I mean, being a guy that would be on the forecheck looking for a big hit, I mean, that's as as clean as it's going to get, right? Like you said, like yes. Yeah part of the, 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 the onus of the puck carrier is to be responsible with their head up and not putting themselves in vulnerable positions. And then, you know, as the four checker, you, you're, you're kind of coached or trained to say, take advantage of guys putting themselves in bad positions, uh, w- obviously within the confines of the rules in the game. But to me, it's like, I would have blown that guy up a hundred times out of a hundred. There's no question. And again, the, the, the shoulder from what I saw went right through his chest cavity and if there's any momentum that pulled him upwards and off his feet, I'm not sure that was an actual jump. It was just the momentum. Because when you when you blow someone up and you and you go through someone like that, you know your body is almost flies because there's no resistance. But um, I, you know I I take that hit over and over and over again, and unfortunately got penalized for it. But uh, yeah. um, you know he didn't. I, I don't think he got suspended as of now. But uh, we will see. We need more. We yeah. need more hits. You know, we need more clean hits. You know, I think we've gone right. so far away from like, oh, every every hit is a hitting guy in a vulnerable position. Every head, every sh- hit is a headshot. I don't agree with that. Um, but you got to take care of you know the players, and there's a player safety element, obviously. Um, but to see a nice physical play like that and then get penalized, it kind of just deters guys from making those plays. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. so we got to exactly. find a happy medium, in, hey. in my opinion. Correct. Connor Murphy's the furthest thing from a dirty hockey player. Yeah, exactly right. Also, I mean, I don't know if he's ever been suspended. I I don't know that know him that well, but I know he's not a dirty player. I know him a little bit from his dad. You know, his dad was here yeah, coaching. That's right. And dad played the game for a long time, and Connor's not a dirty player. I know that, and so I I don't know. But uh, other thing I wanted to bring up real quick was. Uh, Daryl Sutter being back. In the oh league. yeah, right. Oh, Unbelievable! I flavor. thought he was done, man. I thought oh, he was man. done. I thought he had had enough. <laughs> you would think so, right? You go scare the <laughs> shit out of a bunch of uh, other hockey players in Calgary now, man. Oh my God! I mean, yeah. it's going to be a different animal for them. I feel bad. You know, they better start winning some games. It's going to be a long rest of the season. I'll tell you what. If I heard um, one of the things I I don't I've met Daryl a few times, obviously, but I don't know him. But I heard. Of, from a few players that were in uh, <clears throat> when he got to LA something. And I think some guys don't want to hear, but I think if you want to have a successful team and, and be a real team, I think it's something that needs to be done. And what he did when he came in there and took over for Terry Murray that year, they yeah, won the, they won you the know, cup. ended up winning the cup. Uh, it was Richie, obviously Richie's uh, Mike Richards and Jeff Carter were there that year, that first year. But, uh, he came in and pulled every single player in his office and said, here's your role. Yeah. If you don't like it, you know, we'll find somewhere for you to go play or we'll send you down. And, I mean, you know, he sat a guy down that maybe thinks they're a third line or a second line player and said, no, you're fourth, fourth line and that's your role for this team and we need you to do it. And if you can't, you're not going to play. Yeah. Bottom line. I mean, to me, I think I, – th- I love that. Like, yeah. If I was no, a coach – in basketball and hockey, whatever, I think your players need to know your role because sometimes there is, you know, like maybe some questions, you know, about, sure. you know, you, Riles, you maybe think, well, I'm a th- I'm, I should be on the third line. I'm better than this guy or that guy. No, this is where you're playing. This is the role we want you in. Bottom line. Yeah. Boom. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. We probably could talk to Zach and find out. A, yeah, we'll a little get him bit back on. Yeah, if, exactly. On. But uh, I, I just heard that years ago and I just thought, 
it's a it's a way of guys you're gonna hurt some guys' feelings probably, but at the end of the day they won the Stanley Cup and they did it two out of what three years or whatever it was and he's yeah I don't know I just I think that's I think that's pretty cool yeah and yes it sounds like such a simple thing right it's like oh you think that every coach would just lay out your role and you know this is this is what you're expected to do. The the, yeah. the the irony of it is that it doesn't really happen that way. I think there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of gray area with these players and what they think and what they think, um, you know, how they evaluate their play and where they think they should be, in, you know, in, in these moments because they're not necessarily being honest with themselves. But, you know, Sutter has obviously been proven to be a an honest guy, brutally honest at times. But, um, you know, yeah. the, the fact is, is like something as simple as, okay, uh, let's define the player's role as well. It's like, oh, big, big shocker, the coach would do that. I mean, a lot of coaches don't necessarily have that exact conversation. It's kind of like, oh, you're slotting in the top two lines in the three and four for now. Um, and, you know, right. but, but then, you know, if you're going to be a contender and win, it's like you might have to take a lesser role and play a little bit more of a minimalized role and be okay with that. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems logical that any coach would do that, but, um, it has a huge impact when it's like a very firm voice looking you right in the eye, probably a death stare and saying, this yeah. is what you're doing. And, and if you don't like it, like you said, you, you can go somewhere else. We'll find somewhere else for you. So you either buy in or you go away, you know? So, right. um, I think the shelf life of a guy like that, um, is a, is a, is a lot less than maybe more of a player's coach. Um, but that being said, he wins. You know, he wins early. Yeah. He gets the team, at least turns the team around. I don't, I'm not sure in Calgary's situation how, how much, you know, turning around there is to do exactly with that team. But um, they'll have a different look, a different energy for sure. I'm sure a guy like Reno will, um, you know, not, not that he's not juicing it up already, but, you know what I mean, once he gets in there, he might come in with a little yeah. more fire. Um, but, um, no, it'd be interesting how that one plays out. You know, you, you said it, it. it is hard. Some guys don't want to hear something like that you know it could be the way they've been brought up their whole life they've been you know pampered a bit you know there's some guys that have some guys that haven't but a, a great example is scotty scotty lawton right when he was you know he's in nhl and they're like look we think you're going to be best for this organization if you go down and you learn how to play in all situations a penalty kill be a fourth line player he did it he did it like a pro He's made it back, and he's even better. Right. You know, you can move lots up and down the lineup. 100%. Uh, he's proven that. He yeah. scores big goals. Um, and he that just reminds me of somebody that can handle that and took – and he got sit down. It wasn't even like you're on the fourth line, suck it up, yeah. or we're getting rid of you. He literally went, you know, went down, worked his bag off, and, you know, he's, he's, he's a very important player for the Flyers, man. He yeah. really is. And, um, you know, he was willing to do that. So, anyway. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it's humbling, right? Especially if you're a first-rounder and you're, you're, you've notoriously been a goal scorer and the go-to guy. Then all of a sudden, yeah. the coach or the GM is having this heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you saying that you need to go down to the minors and become a checker. You know, learn, go, learn, yeah. go learn how to play defense and, and, and learn how to play the, a solid checking game. It's humbling, but if you have the right attitude, like lots did, um, you know, you come back up. We knew, we knew you had the offensive ability, you know, the speed and the, and, and the quickness and that. But when you're in your mind, you're like, well, I got to be a first round pick and I got to be this, you know, top two line guy right out of the gates. It's a lot of pressure right. to put on yourself and you're not focusing on defense and you're not checking well and then you're not scoring enough. And then obviously when you're not scoring enough, you're not checking well enough. It's like you're not going to be in the lineup. Yeah. So. Um, but nice to see him come, you know, come full circle and, and back up with the right attitude and, and really, really in, in improve his game. You know, his, the value of his game has improved overall 200 foot game. And, you know, like you said, he can move up and down the lineup and he fits right in and he brings some energy. So nice to see. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> All right, Riggs, let's get into our interview with Josh Gratton, which is brought to you by DraftKings Sportsbook. It's that time of year again. Conference tournaments are tipping off. Bubble teams are making their final push for a bid while the top seeds are preparing for what they hope is a long run. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting new customers in the center of the action. Bet $4 on an underdog, win $256 if they win. It's that simple. That's bet $4 on an underdog in select college basketball games, and if they win, you collect $256. The bank is open, baby. 
Just like when Nasty's taking a jumper. Bang! In the net. Don't even hit the rim, boys. Anyway, pick one of many select college basketball underdogs for your shot at winning $256. All it takes is a $4 bet. There's no better way to put your college basketball knowledge to the test than to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. Don't worry if college basketball isn't for you. DraftKings Sportsbook offers great odds and promotions on golf, hockey, and so much more. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code KNUCKLES when you sign up to turn $4 into $256 if the underdog of your choosing pulls off the upset. That's code KNUCKLES to turn $4 into $256 for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows, Racetrack, and Casino. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Welcome back to another episode of Nasty Knuckles. I'm Riley Cote. And I'm Derek Suttlemeyer. And this week we have a great guest, our good buddy, absolute warrior, Josh Gratton. What's up, guys? How's it going, boys? Thanks for having me on. No yeah, problem. man. Thanks for coming, bro. It's good to see you. Looking good. Yeah, feeling good. Feeling good. How about you guys? How you been? Yeah, been good. Yeah, I can't not, complain. Not bad, brother. Not bad. Um, you're pretty damn jacked, Josh. Seen some <laughs> pictures lately, brother. What do you What have you been up to, man? Not much. Just working out quite a bit. Staying Staying in shape. I wish I had to did this when I was playing. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> I was fat, <laughs> I was 15 pounds overweight. Uh, yeah, you're looking good, brother. I know you've put in a lot of work over the last uh, how many years? Uh, you know, your physical health, but I think you've you know taken your mental health to a whole other level. So, congrats on all that. I mean, obviously, it's a, a never-ending journey, but you're, you're looking you're looking mighty healthy. Yeah, it's, it was it was a little rough go there when I finished playing, but. Uh, I went through some dark times. I've been on the other side of that now and working working through it day by day and taking care of myself off the ice and, and away from uh, away from everything else and worry about myself more or less uh, on a daily basis, which is nice. So, Yeah, for sure. And do you find that some of that came from just not knowing? You know, when you're in, in the hockey world, you kind of like, well, maybe you don't know next year where you're going to play, but you know you're going to play. Was it a little bit um, about the uncertainty of where you were going? You think? Yeah, I think a lot was a fear of unknown for sure. That's uh, that was a big part of it, and just being a creature habit and having that routine and, and hockey to fall back on it when when it was gone and and all the uncertainty definitely uh, put the stress levels up to a, an all time high. And I, I coped it and and took uh, the did the wrong wrong things for my body, my mind, and. I had to I had to learn the hard way, unfortunately, and but now I, I've reached out and I've had help with through through even yourself helping me through a lot of stuff with the plant medicine and advice in general. It's uh, it's really helped me through uh, through a lot of stuff. So it's all about uh, getting getting through it day by day and reaching out to the connections. And I felt like uh, at first it was a uh, uh, I kind of uh, isolated myself, which is probably the wrong thing to do at, at that time. And I've learned from my mistake and now it's time to pay it forward to other people. So it's good. Nice. That's good. It's really good advice. I mean, you're not going to help anybody if you keep, uh, you know, you keep too, you know, too quiet, you know, about it. It's like, it's, it's, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a normal thing to want to ask for help. And I think that should be good advice to young children and, you know, the youth and even adults, you know, people are too proud sometimes. And I was, I was guilty for it as well. And, um, I, I think part of what you went through too, and I went through a little bit is like a little bit of an identity crisis. I mean, you were a tough guy you're in a very identified role on a hockey club. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I'm not that anymore. I'm no longer a hockey player. Now, now what am I? And there's a little bit of soul searching. I know I went through that personally. Uh, which is difficult, you know, you have to trans transition the way you think and, and kind of recreate yourself, if you will. So uh, I'm happy to hear that you've been able to, to be been able to figure that out because a lot of guys don't, unfortunately. So uh, the fact that you're saying paying it forward and being of service is, is super important to help our fellow brethren out, you know, because there's so many guys struggling out there. It's it's sad, really. That's it. And 
for myself, it's a big thing is when I hear from other guys that, that went through it and, and are got through it, got through the dark times and, and you can relate to them and to the, to the extent of it, almost to a T of some of the, some of the things that people go through that I went through. So it, when you see that and you have hope, uh, you, you get some hope from, from guys that have already battled through it. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to do for other guys that are going to go through the exact same thing I went through and they see that. I got through it or they see like when I when I was following you or other guys that, that have been through a lot of stuff and, and, and problems and issues they got through it it's you, the way you went through it and then progressed and thrived in, in all your business adventures and everything like that it's definitely gave me confidence and, and hope moving forward so that's it's, it's really good to, to have that for myself to look through and, and see that nice yeah, yeah for sure man that's really good. It's it's good to see, man. I I didn't uh, probably when you were, you know, grats when you started going overseas and playing near the end there the last few years. Like it was hard to keep in touch with you, um, obviously. But uh, I didn't know until recently about the you know you having you're having some problems, obviously, and uh, it's got to be tough. I can't imagine, especially with the roles both of you guys played. I can't pretend to know you know something about that. I never played um obviously played the game just been around it my whole life but uh even for me i've been out a year now and again i didn't go through anything like you two having to do for a job which is is uh just a crazy thing but uh it was tough on me mentally still is a little bit so it's tough i i, I can only imagine what you were going through riles you know i know a lot about riles but uh proud of you man and, and glad to see you doing so well I appreciate it, and yeah, again, I appreciate the support, and now on the other side of, it, of things, so it's uh, it's in the rear view now, and I'm looking forward to the future, so it's all good. Beauty. Well, let's, uh, I mean, obviously important stuff to talk about, but let's, uh, let's turn the tune a little bit and talk about, uh, you know, what you're doing now, and let's talk about, uh, you know, your, your hockey career, because it's pretty fascinating and remarkable how you, you're able to extend your career in play so long and be basically touring the world playing hockey, so... Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, and we'll get into some of the hockey stories. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough to play 16 years, and now I'm on the other side of the game. I got a coaching job offer here in uh, December, and to coach the USPHL team here in Potomac, and uh, it's so far so good. It was uh, tough to walk in into. It was a bad team uh, that I got handed, but. Uh, you know what? I've learned a lot from from my first couple months here, and now it's uh, on to the recruiting process and and building my own team and putting my stamp on a on an organization, with, which I'm really excited for. So, uh, yeah, that's just the season ended a week ago, and uh, it was a pretty pretty long long year with the team that I walked into. Great kids, and I had a lot of fun. It was just not the most competitive team, so it was a long year in that sense, but. Again, I, I've learned a lot from the year and learned what, what I want to do moving forward. So it's uh, it, it's exciting. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to be a part of this organization, and it's a, it's a great spot for myself. That's awesome. Do you, Grats, do you find yourself, you know, as a player back in the day, I'm sure there were many times where you got the coach chirping, and you're like, go fuck yourself, you know, under your breath, or maybe even to him, and now you're on that side of it, and you're like, fuck's going on with these kids man they don't listen I'm just, yeah. how hard is it to get the puck in deep how many times are you told that just get it and you're like fuck you you know now you're now you're the bench boss and the in the boss running the place man what's that like it's it's funny you say that because i was thinking to myself after the first five games i was like holy shit john stevens must have fucking hated me <laughs> <laughs> hate, like I didn't mean hated me. I meant like hated dealing with a guy like myself. Like never know what you're gonna get coming to the rink. Is he is he gonna show up tonight or is he not? So I, I meant uh, like that actually went through my head uh, my first five games, and they're like, holy, all the personalities that, that the coaches had to deal with. Uh, I almost well, felt bad for them dealing with myself and and all the guys that I, I would be around on our team, but. It's uh, it's definitely an uh, it's it's an experience, a learning curve. It's uh, you don't just have to worry about one personality. You have to worry about twenty two other kids and personalities and teenagers and attitudes. So it's uh, it, it is a process and a journey at, at the same time to build these kids. But at the same time, you see them thrive and you start seeing things building and 
and them listening, you get a lot of satisfaction out of helping these young kids in. But that, again, some of them come into the rink, you, whether they want to be there or they don't, uh, you got to try to make them be there. And I, yeah. I, I just reminded, reminds me of how, how many times Johnny Stevens or coaches must have been like, what's Gratz doing last night? Where is he doing <laughs> yeah. last night? You know what I mean? Were the boys running? <laughs> that was yeah. a very good. That's it. Nah, were the boys running? <laughs> well, I was with them. No, they weren't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just so. some water and a little dinner and we were done. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Eight five three five on, so I didn't smell like booze. When I showed <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the uh, yeah. it's funny you you say that. Like, I would imagine I. I don't know if you know this, Gratz, but I was pretty successful this year with my uh, Chipmunk League uh, ball hockey uh, team. My son was on it, Elvis. Yeah. Champs. Anyway, not a big deal. I'm figuring. I'm waiting on some calls. Maybe you need a good assistant. I come in. I I won't. I won't try to overstep your. You know. And, and take you can always over use your a nasty. Yeah, I know you'd be, you'd definitely bring uh, bring light to the table. Right, sure. <laughs> well, what I was going to ask you is like you you said you know you got twenty two guys you're worried about. Do you find yourself having to deal with this guy differently? As in, you both know like sometimes you got to pat a guy, and then there's some guys you got to be like, let's fucking go. You know, like is that hard because there's so many different personalities? Yeah, definitely is, especially at the teenager age uh, that way and attitudes and people, a lot of them think they're entitled here and there, not in a bad way, just the way they were brought up uh, in the coaching world. And some of them hadn't been coached properly to my liking or, or maybe they don't like the way I coach. It's a, it's all personality management and you got to pick and be careful who you're harder on. And, and sometimes you got to give the guy a slap in the ass and get him going. Uh, and it's uh and that's that being my first three, four months of being a head coach. It's a, learning a lot, a lot. It's it's more myself learning because I have never really been through it before. So I guess it's a it's a process, and I'm I'm excited to do it. I love coming to the rink every day, and I love interacting with these kids, and, and they're making my life way better. As long and I, me being a mentor and trying to teach them the game. The way I played it is, uh, it, it's a little different now than, than when we played back in the day with me and Riles. But it's still the element of of, of getting kids, get, getting them going and motivated. It's still the same. So it's it, it's exciting and it's fun. Yeah, that's it's awesome, awesome, man. There's I, definitely I, I a few think... things that would change, hey, as far as like those ingredients you're talking about, and then yeah. it's just really about how to communicate that to the players. I and mean, everyone, you know, knows about hard work and you know some of these superficial expectations. But I think like getting the most out of the players, I think, really comes down to communication and how you you know connect with that guy because everyone's so different. Like you said, that that stuff will never change, right? I mean, it's just like what the coach's job is to do, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I think you're a good role model overall because you're, you you were a worker, you know, grunt worker, you've learned the hard way. You've done, you know, just like myself, you've done a lot of things the wrong way and still were able to be, you know, successful. You know, and if you think about like things you could have changed, you know, you could take that information and help these guys out. So it's uh, important, important stuff, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing is, is especially guys like yourself and I have been through the ringer and back so we can teach them more what not to do than what to do right. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah, so. Truth, yeah, yeah, what not to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how not how not to be a pro athlete? <laughs> yeah, perfect example, Josh. Graff. Yeah. So let's talk about old grats. Just the grats that you know I remember playing, and I'm you know, just talking more on like the hockey side of things. You know, the first uh, the, the, the first time where we played together um, was it was in oh four oh five um, in the, with the Phantoms, the lockout, and we won the Calder Cup together. You know, t I mean, I know you played maybe half a season in the American Hockey League before that. And you signed uh, with the with the Flyers, you know that off season. Talk about your experience in Philly and that, that first year specifically with the you know with you know, Nasty's on the team. Obviously, we had an amazing team, tough team. What an experience that was. Fuck, we had so much fun. I, I look back to that being the highlight of my career, and I won a championship in Manchester, but it did never, not even close to compare to to that year that we won it in, in Philly. It was awesome and so much fun. The group of guys we had, fuck, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Too much fun almost. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Right. I remember we would go every every Sunday, we would go after a win. Most of the time we'd win because we were so good, but we would be yeah. right after Daniels. I'd be the first one there and the last one to leave. No so. way. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. What a place though. And oh, we, Danny we, Moore, Danny Moore. Danny Moore, that's I it. Saw him we a few a times this summer, Gratz. Saw him a yeah. few times. Yeah, yeah. He opened up a dojo, man. 
No shit. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's still he's still bartending and everything, but yeah, he, he opened up a dojo and he's he's doing really well, man. But what what, to, what a time, eh? We're gonna have to get up there this summer and see you guys for sure. Yeah, but, like you're close. Yeah, that was a, that was an awesome time. We had a lot of a lot of fun, man. I, I lived with Ben Eager that year, and me and Eags, uh, that that place was something else uh, coming in and out of that place. But it was a, it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Riles, uh, Riles, the year before we got you, congrats! It was 2003 and four. He started the year uh, in the coast, I think, in San Diego. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I think in 30 games, I think you you racked up like 239 or 240 minutes. So obviously, that got everyone's attention. I can't imagine like you're you're a young kid, but your mentality must have just been, I got to do this to get to you know not that you had to because because you weren't a bad hockey player either to be honest like none of you guys were like to get to the level you ended up at you're you're, you're not a bad hockey player but it's like Riles has said before you kind of gotta this is the way I'm definitely gonna get there so I'm gonna do it I I couldn't imagine you know in 30 games you got 240 minutes man like you must have fought once to twice a night yeah like, it was. It, it was a grind, but I was told that Steve Martinson was my head coach. He was a tough guy back in the day, and yep. he said the fastest way out of the East Coast is fight. So I, what I did is I went out there and I fought every game. Every every guy I would come on and and challenge me, or I would be challenging them. And then I got called up to uh, to to Cincinnati that's, that year. That's and where I, I first saw you. Back and we we I we went in there, Riles. That's what I was going to say. So he had been in San Diego and. Um, we get to Cincy and he had been there maybe a, a couple weeks and the, you know, how the word spreads tough guy, like tough guys. So we knew, uh, about Gratz, never seen him, never met him. Uh, we had called Les Borsheim up our buddy. Uh, he's out in Colorado now, um, uh, had an unfortunate accident. I don't know if you knew about that, uh, Josh, uh, yeah, on a motorcycle, yeah. but, uh, he's doing great, man. He, he's working his ass off and. He's a huge inspiration for people, man. He he, he gives it every day, man. Um, but uh, great guy. But anyway, Borsch unfortunately caught the wrong end of uh, Gratz's <laughs> fury there, and and oh. uh, you know I just was th I remember thinking to myself like this this guy's a kid and he's you know Borsch is a little older than you, big tough you know obviously a tough guy. Maybe you even fought him before. I'm not sure, but no. uh, you know you you kind of <laughs> uh, caught him a couple times there, and he had. Cat had to take him off the ice, and then, uh, then you you get out of the box. You got Pete Vandermeer tapping you on the shoulder. I'm just like, well, fucking, what a way to, you know. Yeah. Of course, we we saw it a lot more back then, but uh, you know, it was, it was crazy. I think uh, 21 games, you put up basically 70 minutes in Pims, and then next year we signed you, and we we're like, yes, like this guy <laughs> is, a, is a meant to be a phantom slash flyer. You know, uh, you fit in great and. What a team, like you guys were saying. You got, you got Riley, you got Divi, Ben Eager, yourself. I mean, a lot of tough, a lot of middleweight tough guys too um, on that team. Ryan Reddy, even even Murph, like Murph would chuck yeah. him when he yeah. had to. I mean, it was a ton Murph, of guys. Right? Yeah, for, oh, we had Fridge. I forget. Yeah, how do you fit, forget Fridge? I would have to. Yeah, Fridge, yeah. But yeah, we had a really tough team. And that, you guys. That whole league. <laughs> it was. What's that? Right. That, that league that year, like the American League that year, was full of meat. Every team had three or four guys. Oh, yeah. Man. There was, if you didn't have – every like I think you probably had almost 40 fights. I had 30 in there or something like that. Like we, There must have been two or three fights a game. It was oh, God, yeah. Crazy. yeah, we were active. We were young guys, right, too, between yourself, Eags, and myself. You know, Fridgey is obviously already established, but – there was a lot of other hungry young guys in the league, Brian McGratton and Colton Orr, you know what I mean? And there was like a, just a lot of young blood <laughs> that, yeah. you know, again, it was the best league in the world at that time because the NHL it was, wasn't going yeah. on. It was super, super competitive. And, um, yeah, what a, what, a, what a year that was. I mean, I just looked back and we didn't have anybody in the top 20 scoring. We were just like scoring by committee. But, again, like, you know, solid goaltending, nitty and litz and defense all the way out through the forwards. And, you know, a lot of these guys, I mean, most of these guys hadn't established themselves in the NHL yet. I mean, no, besides the only picking and maybe had played a year. Yeah. Um, we had, like, if you look back at that team, I think we had probably 10 or 12 guys that probably have played over five, 700 games in the NHL. Right. I would say a close, at least close to that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Hell of a I mean, team. We had Karts and Rick come up and pretty much put us over the top for the playoffs. Yeah. But, what, guys, what, a, what a couple pickups that ended up being. I think Jeff led us in scoring, if I'm not mistaken, in the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Nitty 
couldn't be scored on. I mean, like the guy was, yeah. especially in the finals. I know we talked about this. I can't remember who we had. Oh, it may have been with uh, Mike Richards. We were talking about that first game in Chicago, game one. They came out just <laughs> flying. And, you know, we hadn't played them. So you don't really know a whole lot. You know they're good. They got a good team. They had some good pickups, uh, you know, at the deadline. That didn't seem fair, actually. Because they picked those guys up from another. Yeah. Was it Bo Meester and Weiss, right? Yeah, right. So they picked them up. But uh, I remember that first period. They must they must have had four to five, like two on one, three on ones, and Nitty just kept everything out of the net. And I remember Ben Stafford, Ducky, coming out after the first period, and he like I was doing someone's skates, and he just gave me a look like, holy fuck, <laughs> like these guys are good, and yeah. then. You know, we we got our legs underneath us and end up winning that game. I don't know if that game was the overtime game or game two was, but either way, we won like two to one or one nothing. I don't even know what it was, but uh, but I, I remember we've talked about this as well. You and and Riley, the the big crash line there against Scranton. We're down at home and we lose this game. We're down three going into the third, I believe, maybe four. Thank you. And you guys turn the. You guys turned the game around, man. I mean, and Johnny was double. She, you guys were probably like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> this is a, we're playing a lot, man. <laughs> because he kept rolling. You guys were hot. Grats, you scored a big goal. I mean, it's just everything. Just The whole team was a team. Yeah. And yeah. It, was, it was, was just so much fun to be a part of. You remember when, when uh, Nitty got pulled and then we came back? I think we almost might have tied it up. That he did. just grabbed all his stuff and just took, went right back out there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then they they got one late, and we ended up losing them. But we won the next game against in Providence in Providence, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. And Richie, no. Richie had actually gotten a fight with uh, this kid Bruins. ended up on the uh, the Bruins the next year. Oh man, I can't believe I can't remember his name. But was it uh, they got suspended. It wasn't Bergeron. It was another skilled guy though. It wasn't Bergeron. It was a guy with like blondish hair. I remember Richie cut him. He was bleeding. Looked like the Nature Boy Ric Flair. With <laughs> blonde locks bleeding, but. Um. Yeah. What a team, man! You guys were you guys were awesome. It was so much. Like you said, uh, Gratz, it was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. Good coaches too, Johnny and Craig Berube. They they made it they made it that much better for us, and they they knew how to. They were players' coaches, right? And guys yeah. wanted to play for them, so it was it was that much uh, that much more enjoyable winning it and being part of it with those guys as well. Yeah, yeah, we had Chief on, and he had some you know awesome stories. I think we lined up talking about you at one point, but um, you know between Chief and, and Johnny, I learned a lot from those guys too. Whether I really recognize it in the moment, or I look back and reflect on them as as like you know just say people, but like you know character character humans, right? I mean, I think Johnny was one of the first coaches that I had that actually like sat me down and like talked to me like a human being and you know and and you know whether it was good or bad or my, my play on the ice he was she was trying he was at least trying to get inside my head and and and, and help me out you know and just like that sense of compassion and chief was obviously just a, a good overall dude as far as like listening and you know being there so you don't really in the moment you're kind of like wow you can maybe you're almost spoiled, you know, that I've had a lot of coaches that aren't like that, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that we weren't able to go on and win the whole thing and have that team and that experience, uh, you know, with the coaching staff and not to mention Sammy, I mean, Shell Samuelson, I worked with him after the fact too, you know, learn a lot from these guys, you know, and, and again, when you're young and in the moment, you don't necessarily think you're learning anything. I think when you look back and reflect, you learn a shitload yeah. um, and it kind of kind of creates your, your character, especially now you're in coaching too. I mean, I'm sure you can take a, a lot out of Johnny's book there too and Absolutely. Chiefs. I, 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 even even Paul Holmgren as well. Like yeah. uh, he, yeah. he was something something else as well. I remember the first time I came, I had signed and I came to Philly for that prospects camp in the summer or whenever. And I got there a day late and oh, Paul Holmgren sitting in, uh, in the cold tub up to his neck, right? Just sit, <laughs> I, I go in there and, I'm first, and I thought it was a hot tub. Hey, I go, I go. Oh, how's the hot tub? Cold, kid. Straight face. <laughs> uh, hey, anything? I was like, okay, I better go now. <laughs> Sitting good, up there. Good talk. Me. Good talk. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he, he was really good to me as well. The whole organization in Philly was really good for good to me from the first day I got there till the second day, the second time I got traded. I guess. Still, I wish I had got to play there a lot longer than I did. It was awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a lot of fun, man. I, I, I tell you what, I, I've, I've told this story a hundred times, Gratz, but <clears throat> 101 here. Uh, so many times, you guys were dropping the mitts. Obviously, you knew that. But uh, 
One of my favorites was uh, you and Dennis Bonvey. And every uh, game, Bones, what a good dude, man. I, I, I get to run into him once in a while, man. He just makes me laugh. But I, I never forget, we I got to know him because he actually, before you guys played with the Phantoms for like, he got traded at the deadline. That's right, um, yeah. A few years before. And uh, so I got to know him. So I would always go down and say hey to Bones. He, he Or he would walk down the hallway. So I'm sitting there. I was like, oh, you got the knuckles sharpened up tonight? You know, like just fucking with him. And he's like, ah. Oh. I can't go. My hands are hurt. And fuck it, you guys dropped a puck. He's whacking. You guys are like dropping him. Like he's trying to act like he's not gonna tilly. You know he's gonna tilly. It's like it's bones, right? So anyway, you guys get into an unbelievable fight, just toe to toe, which is that's how you fought. And uh, we come in like I mean, you guys just pounded each other. Great fight. Um, got got all the boys going. Come in and right away, like as you guys go in the locker room, I take a quick turn and I go right to AP's office. The video coach Adam Patterson, it's like let let's watch it. So there's like I, I think Tuna was in there with me, and you know like we're we want to watch it. So he's got it in slow motion. You guys are throwing. He hits you one time in your nose, and your eyes don't shut. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it, and your nose just like flattens. But you never your eye you don't even go like this. You don't make any kind of moves. Your eyes are wide open, and then you catch him. And we're like, oh, my God. Like, I don't know. I get tapped in the nose, and I'm like, my eyes get watery. You, you like, took a full-fledged punch right to your nose, and your eyes never shut. So the best is we watch it. You got tagged if you, like, you know, five, six, seven times, whatever, and you tagged him about 20. But uh, come in, and I, like, gave you a tap. And I was like, fuck, great tilt, you know, and you're like, thanks, you know, like. You don't have a mark on your face, which we've talked about a hundred times. You just got punched in the face fucking seven times, no marks. And you're like, I said, great tilt. And you're like, oh, thanks. He's like, he never even hit me. I was like, what? Never hit you. I said, he hit you about seven times right in the face. Like one time right in the nose. And and you're like, pillows, boys, pillows. (laughs) Never forget that. As I always say that pillows, boys. Oh my God. We, but Riles is tell him what you were talking about earlier about when he got cut. Well, yeah, I was saying to Nasty earlier, uh, you know, I, I'd never seen you get cut except for one time. And I'm not even sure if it was from a fight or a puck, but either way, you got cut and, and it just it was just a cut. There was no, there was no blood that came out of it. It was just, it was just like, <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just one time. Phone. Oh, man. I was just like, I've never seen anything like it. And you don't, you don't mark, you don't cut. You know, you uh, just if you went into the box and he got hit a few times, he'd be just a little red. But by the time the five minutes were done, you're like, this guy, he, he didn't even have a mark on his face. It was unbelievable, man. And you yeah. and you know, Gratz, like, I mean, for me, for the guys that both of you two fought, like, you're undersized to be fighting yeah. those guys. I mean, you guys fought monsters and you both stood in there and did unbelievable. But, like, to not have any not have any marks and to throw toe to toe like i mean you were willing to take five to give your five i mean i watched oh, yeah. that mcgratton fight uh in the spectrum this morning i forgot about that fight. i mean oh, you yeah, two both just terrible. pounded each i mean he got you a couple ago you got him but you never both of you never went down and, and you guys must have fought a minute you know over a minute I mean, I just, oh. just look. It, it had to be so exhausting, man. Like, yeah, that was that was probably one of the best fights I had ever ever really been in, and it was an American League there. And he was he was hungry, I was hungry, and we just went after it. And I fought him a couple times after that, and he gave it to me every other time. But that was the one time I actually hung in there with him, and uh, that, that's it was it was a marathon fight for sure. And, and but uh, you know, all those all those years, uh, and even Riley went through it. All those years uh, being undersized, it's never easy to. Mm. But you know what? It's it's your job, and you do it for the boys, and you you show up. And it's not whether you win or lose because I lost ninety percent of my fights. I'd say a lot oh, of times. I wouldn't but say that. Not, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. But maybe, but. Either way, it's being undersized. It's not easy, but it's showing up, and it's for the team and for the boys. It's at the end of the day, that's what mattered. Yeah, no, for sure. And I know I think of you, Gratz, and like in your fights, or just like something out of a something out of a movie most of the time, where it was just like there was like this element of endurance, like fearlessness, bombs, uh, like heavy punches. Oh. Um, 
at just like re- relentlessness and like it wasn't just like one every 10 fights i feel like every fight if not every other fight <laughs> that you had at least that i can remember were like that you know or it was just like it was there was no like you say no easy fights it wasn't an easy five minutes for fighting and then let's go rest in the penalty box like your your minutes were hard-earned minutes compared to some fighters that I've seen. Like it's it's insane. I mean, and and, and to do that, not only do that, you did you did the American League Coast, American League, NHL, and then you went overseas to a bunch of different leagues and and, and started beating the pants off. Um, you know the, the, these guys. Like I just you know I, nothing but props. I mean, I retired when I was 28. I was I was fucking done with it. But you just kept you kept getting stronger. You get in better shape, and you know what I mean. So props to you overall because I never seen anything like it. I appreciate it, but I appreciate you, it. That means you, a lot coming from you. You remember? Uh, I know you guys remember the the games we had when we were with the Phantoms. The 11 a.m. the school day game. Oh yeah. You right off and the who did you fight? Who was that? Mike Brown, I think, right? The one he yes. dropped him. I'm like, yeah. it's 11.03 in the morning. <laughs> and Sponge the puck Bob drops and you two drop the gloves. And I just remember thinking, I, I, I don't know how in the hell you're going to do this right now at 11 a.m. And you, uh, I mean, it's and the kids are playing SpongeBob <laughs> Square. But like, <laughs> what? Like, don't oh, ruin Lord. the moment, man. <laughs> it's, but it was like, I just... I. Just couldn't even imagine dropping the Mets at 11 a.m. Riles, you probably fought that game too because you guys seemed to fight every damn game. Um, <laughs> you guys were so good. Uh, I like so, the 11 o'clock tillies. Get it out of the way. Don't have to worry about it. It'd been better on a Sunday because we could have got to uh, McDaniel's earlier and, and saw the, the second it games, hurt. you know, starting at four instead of the eight o'clock games. Yeah. I, yeah. We, we talk about going to McDaniel. Man, that was just. Those are some of the best. I mean, you just, it's almost like you just get this game over with, boys. It's Sunday, three and three, and everybody's, you guys had to be exhausted. I know I was. I didn't do half of what you guys were doing, but I tell you what, we sure did get revamped when we, when yeah. that game was over. We were heading to McDaniels to see everybody, but you'd have no problem playing four and five if you're knowing you're going on <laughs> Sunday right now. Yeah, yeah, right. Monday's the day off. You knew that. Yeah, exactly. It, I think it, the it, best part of it. Was that it wasn't just like two or three guys? It was like ninety percent of the team. There, you know, it was it was something else because I never experienced that after that year. That you know that many guys from a team no. showed up at a bar together. I, I consistently. Think that, that, was big, that was a big reason why we won. I think we were so, yeah. so tight, even from from the oldest guy. Like uh, Slains would be there. John yep. Slaney was yeah. almost 38, 40 years old, and and he'd be there uh, having a time with the boys or with the twenty year olds. Like it. It makes a big difference when your team becomes that close and you guys battle and have fun together. It's, 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 uh, you can't beat it, you know? Yep. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I, I could say on a couple of teams that I played on, when, when the veterans, um, connect with the with the rookies and the younger the guys the team the chemistry is so much better versus like when it's like you know the the veterans are too cool for school and those are just the rock piles i feel like the, the team never connects and you i'm sure you've been on teams like that but it separates the team where you're just like the hierarchy of veteran and rookie but the team like that that's a perfect example that year is that everyone was kind of like together it was just like a, 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 a nicely assembled team and everyone connected yeah, I think Neil Little had a big part to do with that. Like he was such a team guy, backup goalie, old, older veteran guy that uh, that everybody looked up to and always kept the room light. And he was he was the one at the bar, like getting everybody laughing, smiling, oh, man. And, and putting or and setting up team parties. Like and to have your backup goalie and a veteran guy to do that, it just it sends just sends a message from a positive message throughout the whole whole uh, team, right? Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, I, a good Neil Little story. The first, the, the first night I was in Philly, I was at the the old Hampton Inn, and after the the, the night before the game, he's like, "I'll pick you up." He's like, uh, "I'll pick you up, and we'll go to McDaniel's." It was the literally first day in Philly. So he pulls up to the Hampton Inn, and and, and I, I felt like you know, let's smile, you know, the whole thing is. Like, I feel like I know this guy. Yeah, like, I feel he, like I've known him. For years. He makes you feel Getting that way, shot. man. 
Yeah, oh yeah, getting his truck smells like some reefer. I'm like, oh, I think this is a little more familiar. I was like, I'm like, smells pretty good in here. He's like, yeah, you want to smoke? Sure, all right. So <laughs> first day in Philly, smoking a little herb with Let's, going to the McDaniel's, and the rest is history as far as uh, uh, you know what, what went down that year. But um, you you made a really good point. Is that like I I think of Neil Little as like the first guy that like you know besides Nas that welcomed me, and ha- you know what I mean. He was like one of the, I think he's probably the oldest guy in the team. And, you know, the fact that he reached out, picked me up and, you know, we connected on that level like the first day is, 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 is meaningful, you know, especially for a guy that's, you know, come to a new situation and might be uncomfortable. So um, all that energy, it's like, what do you call it? Syn- synergy, right? I mean, that's what good teams have and, and the ones that obviously are skilled enough with that synergy are the ones that win. So, and we did. Yeah. Good time. Let's but, uh, congrats. Why don't you talk about... Um, um, your, your decision, I know you, you land up leaving Philly and going to, to Phoenix and then you land up back in Philly, but at some point there, you, you decided to, I say, maybe give up on the NHL dream and, and go overseas and, and, and make some money and play and, you know what I mean? And probably fight less and maybe live, live a little bit differently. Um, uh, you know, talk about that decision to, to kind of leave, leave this North American hockey world behind and, and, and pursue that. Uh, I, it was a decision that was torn to, between. It's like ha- cutting the cord with the, with the NHL and, and cutting the cord on your dream, essentially. But I, I was up and down. I was, I was probably playing more uh, uh, more in the American League than I was in the NHL at the time. Still making good money, but I was getting challenged every night by all these young guys, and I had a hard time saying no. I always would just say yes, and and my body was taking a toll. And then I got a got an offer to go to Russia. The year, the summer before, I actually went. I went in like December, but that summer I was getting enticed to go there all that whole year, and I decided to stick it out in Atlanta. I had signed in Atlanta, and I, I had made that team in, out of camp, got sent down, and I was getting challenged, literally challenged every night by like guys like Gazdick, Reeves, and, yeah, right. and I, like they were hungry, like just like where we were when we were uh, twenty years old, and it just kind of started just wearing it on me more mentally than anything just like fuck i gotta do this again and and, you know what i mean like and and i i respected every all of those kids and them wanting to fight and everybody is challenging and that's their job and my job at that time was to oblige them and it's not fun to do it when you have everything at that time to lose in a sense like you have nothing to gain by beating up these rookies you're expected to essentially and it, it was just it kind of got it just got old, so I got offered to go over to Russia, and Chris Simon was on that team. I knew him a little bit, oh, right. before, and Darcy Rose. So we had a bunch of tough guys. So I went over there thinking that, oh shit, I'm going to be able to play some hockey and put and not have to fight as much, knowing that they're there. But when I got over there, it was not the same. The where the mafia boss was the owner, and was this wanted- the guy with the guns? That yeah, exactly, yeah. I heard yeah, he, I've heard stories about him. Like you don't have to get into that, but like yeah, I heard I he is a rodeo. Yeah, he's he's crazy. So you're like a human toy to this guy. So I show up, he pretty much just bought me I'm his toy and he just comes down right. to the dressing room and he goes, uh, Josh, go fight the goalie or you go home. So all right, go uh, Robert Ash was the goalie at the time. No, no, <laughs> I go, I'm not going to fight him. So I went out instead of going and, and run an Ash, I just went and jumped someone else and got kicked out. So, so I didn't have to go fight the goalie, but that's just the way that that was. That's just the way it was there. Uh, was he and, happy with that? Would, is it, was he okay with you doing that? Well, he didn't have a choice cause I was kicked out. So the next game I had to go fight the goalie. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, he did. Okay. But I, when, I, when I first got, when I first got there, I thought I was going to be there going to play hockey and, it was the first five or six times on the ice I got told to go fight. I was like, holy shit. But the money no was so good. I had, I had just left you know, everything in the NHL, the American League. So I had to stick it out. And I'm, I'm glad I did because I was, I got to, I ended up getting to play like, and play, probably work on my game and probably help, help myself prolong my career a bunch of, a bunch of years after I got weathered that storm going uh, to that team in Russia. But it was uh, it was an experience I would never give up uh, forever. Like, I, would, I would do it all over again because uh, I met a lot yeah. of good people through there. I had a lot of good times and life experience that, that has brought me uh, around the world to to Russia of all places to play in the second best league in, in the world. It is now. I, I don't know if it was as good back then. Probably not. But the money was good. Uh, the women were good at the time too. So I had a lot of fun there and. Uh, 
And then again, I went to another team there in uh, in the KHL with Nigel Dawes, uh, Brian sure. Koshensky, uh, and that place was ran like an NHL team uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, Boris Astana. And those guys are still playing like in that league because they yeah. were treated so well there. So I'm glad I got to stick it out uh, from that first team I went. So I got to experience the the real uh, side of hockey in Astana, Barisa. It was an awesome sellout, ten, fifteen thousand 15,000 a night there. You're wow. treated like a king. So it's a, it's a re- it was a really good experience there. We're, Josh, when you, when you were there, um, one of our buddies, I don't know if, Gratch, you may not know Dave McIsaac, but he had played for the Phantoms uh, before. I'm not sure if you ever ran into him, but uh, he ended up at the end of his career, he went over to Russia. And I'm not sure what level he played at. I'm not sure if it was a KHL or not. I'd have to ask him. But uh, he was telling me their coach or owners or whatever were very strict with them. Like they couldn't, they weren't supposed to go out to bars. Now, you trying to tell Mac not to go to a bar didn't happen. He was going, and he did. <laughs> he never got sent home or anything, but he was saying, he was telling me a lot of cool little stories. Were they like that with you, or did they just kind of let you, you know, do your uh, thing as long as it wasn't anything out of, like McDaniels, <laughs> like we were yeah, doing in McDaniels. <laughs> we could have been arrested probably every Sunday. but sure, uh, I should have been. Probably would have been yeah. for me. Um, no, they, they were pretty lenient uh, there in a sense, but like the, the, the owner, the boss, mob guy, uh, he had like a village. So when we'd have days off, he would have like a village with all these like guns, uh, horses, wolves, like a big, huge, huge compound essentially. So when we would have a couple days off, we would, um, we would go out there and he wouldn't let us leave. Like he would just wake up, drink, wake up shots and wouldn't let us leave until he's finally passed out. So he wants to party for two or three days and then we got to stay there and do it. I get, <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, it was crazy. We were there for the year that Canada won the Olympics uh, and scored. Uh, Why well, I don't know. I got to bring that up. Goal to goal. City scored, but we were there and, he, we, we, I couldn't get away, and I, I like to have a lot of fun. But when I'm begging to get out off the compound, you know, <laughs> yeah, right, something's right? not right. <laughs> yeah, That's for no. sure, man. But yeah, it, it was an experience, a crazy experience. I don't think he uh, owns a team there anymore, but uh, they were the ones where like a bunch of tough guys all the time. Uh, like, yeah, right. Yeah, Nazareth. Was four heavyweights that first year you were with Chris Simon, wasn't it? You said Darcy Vero. There was, wasn't there someone else too? Uh, it was us three that year. Then the next year, Brandon Sugden came too. Oh, Sugden, yeah. Did you play there two years? With the, with I the played crazy? a year and a half, so one okay. full year. But then I got to, we got told to go brawl, and we ended up getting a, like a 15 or 18 game suspension. So Would he pay a, you at least since yeah, he was telling you? So, they started a brawl against Ohms right off the right off the draw. It was it was chaotic, and but he had uh, he had called us and we we're in Ohms at the time, and he said he wants to see a brawl. He was having a party, and all his buddies from Moscow were there, so he well, they wanted to see us start a fight, and so Nazar uh, says Nazarov brings us into the into the uh, dressing room after warmups, and he's like, "You Darcy." whoever else there's five of us and they're like start a brawl right off or you don't go back to town and you don't get paid so right off the bat we started a brawl donnie brooke these guys i felt like an absolute yeah. caveman doing it like yeah. it, it was pretty it was pretty bad and embarrassing at the same time but at that time i, I wanted to get my money i wanted to get, get like i didn't really have a choice to do it if i wanted to get paid and the worst part about it was uh I think there was 18 games left, or I got 18 game suspension. There was 20 games left, and Nazarov, the prick he is, he uh, bagged me for 18 straight games just for the two uh, two games that I had left. No way. And they were they were trying to get you so you just leave and wouldn't have to pay. Oh yeah, they don't want to pay you. Yeah, right? I got in sick shape and I just got bagged for for 18 games straight. It was it was hell, but sure. it was, uh, you got paid, yeah. man. Yeah. So, that was wild. I remember that. Who did you grab? It was a, he'd played in the NHL, right? He was a, yeah, was a year. I think Martin School. Yeah, like, yeah. They were all skilled guys. They they had no clue there was coming. The, 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 mob, the mob guy just having a party. He's like, yeah, we're just going to use our human toys here tonight. And go yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I heard wow. someone told me, I don't know if it's true. I got We got you here so we can find out that you guys basically never lost a home game because maybe he was – dishing out a little cake to the to the zebras there yeah well they're not i, I don't know for sure but yeah kind of uh they, it was pretty shady we get a lot of power plays at home it was yeah. probably like 
equally amount. And, <laughs> and it was it was pretty camp. Yeah, but that was like now that the KHL, like the last couple of years, it's kind of a legitimized itself. Like they don't have yeah, that. Right. There was some shady stuff going on uh, my first year or two going on there. For sure. No question. All right. Yeah. I'm glad to see that clean, clean it up a little bit. Because yeah. you know, some of the stories I've heard outside of your stories were, like you said, like really sketchy. Yeah. Or yeah. like scary. Like, you're lucky some of these guys actually make it back alive. Yeah. Um, some of the time, let getting alone. Paid getting paid in cash. Paid. Like getting paid in cash. And I would pour pour my protein powder out and put the money in, then put the protein powder back in and leave it in the hotel. Oh, okay. It was just oh, it was wow. so, so, un, so much uncertainty. The, the, Bob, the boss owned the hotel, so you never knew what, uh, who was going to come oh, right. out of there. So it was, it was, you had to be on your toes at all times for the first, uh, my first two years. And it was nice to be able to get a good experience outside of that uh, with the, within Kazakhstan. But it was, uh, it was a good, good, good chapter of the book, that was for sure. Did, did you, like... Gratz, did you have to go back and play that team, that owner? Did you yeah, ever... they had John Morasti they signed in. We oh. had to fight him twice the next day. And then the next time we went in, he gave it, beat, beat me up pretty good a couple of times. But there, but yeah, we had I had to go back there the, the following year after oh. I left. They oh. had him. They had him foaming at the mouth waiting for me. So. Oh right. He's yeah. pro- I don't know where right. he is, but he's probably uh, foaming at like... the mouth right now. <laughs> like yeah. Fucking like... yeah, he he could take a punch, but he could give it too. He was. And you like doing it, like it just, he loved it. Hey, yeah. you, I've never seen a guy love it more than no, John Rass. Exactly. Do, do you guys remember when he was trying to make Norfolk, and we had that preseason game at the Skate Zone, and it was a they had downtown Brown, Mike Brown. Remember they had Brownie, and I can't remember all their guys, but we were playing at the Skate Zone. It's packed, and he ended up with poor BJ Abel. Yeah, but I but do. I will say. He's grabbing, you know, like BJ's probably sweating, and he did because you know he's caught. He, he had never fought, and Morasti actually let him off the hook. I don't know if you guys remember, but he said, "You've never done this, have you?" And and yeah. BJ's like, "No, but I gotta do it." And he's like, "No, man, no." And he kind of let him <laughs> off the hook. I was like, I just remember thinking, "Oh no!" Like when he grabbed poor BJ. BJ didn't know what to do, so he grabbed a hold of him, and Morasti knew he had never been. I was kind of shocked. I thought he'd fucking just pump him and. <laughs> no, but it was yeah, it was a uh, it was good times over there. I had good times with that. And then you know you play what three? I think three years maybe in, in the KHL. Uh, I would say off and on. I think there may have been a um, you might you might have gone somewhere else in between. But Denmark back to KHL, back to Manchester in the AHL to Finland, I believe, yeah. France, Slovakia, Scotland, wow. and then landed up back France. in the hockey league. Carolina? Yeah, exactly. How was well, South Kaki? How was South Kakalaki? <laughs> oh, I loved it there. That was that was the end of the end of my career. That was the last bit. And it was like coming full circle by the end of it. It was like started in the coast, ended in the coast. But that place was awesome. A great group of guys. As I was older too, and I went in there and all the young guys were awesome. I I had a, some of the most fun I've had in the last like, a few years of my hockey was right there with oh, those that's guys. Awesome. Where, where where is that exactly? Is that in Columbia? Uh Charleston. Oh, it's in Charleston. Oh, so you're at the yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, what a city. Right yeah. near the Citadel, huh? Yeah, a lot of fun there. I was just going to say one other little uh, Gratz fun, kind of funny story is uh, so we, we is the year we won. Obviously, we ended up winning that uh, game six against Providence. Um, and so we set up a dinner at uh, Rock Lobster. And you guys, <laughs> Stormy's the GM there. And the week before, we had had an incident where there was an individual that went to McDaniel's looking for everyone, knowing we weren't there. I say we, like you guys. Uh, well, all of us, but the tough guys. This guy was tough guy looking for, for the Phantom guys. Where are they? And remember, Mike Pacitti was actually didn't get to work with us that year because they brought Adam down from the Flyers. So Mike was in there. Of course, I can't believe Mike was at the bar. Oh, Pac-Man. Uh, but um, I remember him calling me saying, oh, this guy came in. He's looking for everybody. And poor Pac almost fought him. And he's a big dude. He's like six foot four, this guy. And so anyway, um, the next week we win that series. And we started, we may have had a couple at the Spectrum there to celebrate because we're going to the finals and everything. But uh, we were all headed over to Rock Lobster and we got a nice meal set up and it's beautiful outside because it's, you know, it's almost summertime. It's it's getting late. So uh, I grabbed Gratz because, you know, Gratz used to like to have a few beers and a couple drinks and, you know, 
I said, hey, Grat said to me, or is this the guy? Is he, is he here? And I'm like, yes, but listen, don't don't say anything, bud, because it's going to cause me issues at home. I don't need any issues right now. Okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. So we were eating. We probably got through the first set of appetizers, a few drinks. Somebody, the lady running the place, Stormy, comes over, taps me, and goes, come here for a minute. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, no. I look around. Well, Gratz isn't at the table. <laughs> so she goes, what is wrong with you? I set this whole thing up for you. I told you to tell the guys, leave him alone. What happens? Someone just went up to him. And I'm like, who went up to him? <laughs> and she's like, Josh. And I was like, oh, okay. So I go back over and I'm like, Gratz, what did you just do? And he's like, nothing. I just went over and said, hey, I heard you were looking, looking for us. And the guy's obviously playing dumb. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, Nasty said that you were, blah, blah, blah. who's Nasty? You know who Nasty is. I'm right here. You want to talk to me? You know? And the guy's like, no, 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 no problems. You know, and I saw him, Gratz tells me, and I'm like, bro, man, you, you don't understand. I got to deal with this now. And he goes, sorry for partying. <laughs> I miss your yeah. line all the time. I just, trademark. Yeah, it's a trademark line. I bought a golf hat and it actually says on it, sorry for partying. And I, I wear it all the time and I just so think of Gratz because he's yeah. like, sorry for partying. That was my oh. line back in the day. Yeah. yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah. yeah. I heard that several times. <laughs> oh, man. I had a pretty good Gratz story. I don't know if you remember Gratz. Um, we actually were in Columbus Blue Jackets camp together uh, when we were like 18. We were the same age. Yeah. And we went to Traverse City and then whatever played came back and then they were making cuts for all the guys going back to juniors <clears throat> i think you let them getting cut the day before me or whatever it was, it was the same thing they just whatever it was just spaced out the, th the timing of the flights and whatnot but anyways i showed up at the rink and i was like where, where the hell's my shit like you know where's my where's my bag you know i'm missing all my equipment and all this stuff and uh well we'll get you new shoes we'll get you all this stuff blah 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 so i kind of like all right well they took care of me they helped me out and then i forgot about it until you know, I think it's three or four years later, 2004, 2005, when we played together. I think it was towards the springtime because it was warm outside, and you were out there with Eags you know, by your truck, and I see, I see like a, a, a number 59 Columbus Blue Jackets bag, and I'm like, Gratz? He's like, is, it, is, that, is that your bag? <laughs> He's like, yeah, well, I got it from camp. I'm like, I was 59 in Columbus Blue Jackets training camp. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's my bag. <laughs> well, the long story of this, Gratz just fucking when they when they released when they whatever they released all the guys going back to juniors. He just grabbed grabbed bag. I don't know how he grabbed two bags or what, whatever. But you you stockpiled. <laughs> Smart decision. He grabbed my shit. I, I didn't think I was yeah, ever going I, back I, to. I, the I, what's that? I said I didn't think I was ever going back to Columbus. So I just think. Oh, I <laughs> never thought that was gonna yeah. get through oh man that was pretty good though yeah, we got um, a good laugh out of that one eh? yeah i know it was pretty good yeah. that was a pretty cool experience though i think that was like i mean I, that's when i started started to kind of follow you because we were kind of you know i guess two years later kind of competing you know in that same world um but you know recognizing that you that you basically started to take on that role at that training camp yeah at that tournament in traverse city hey eh? Yeah, it was a, that was yeah because in juniors I think we were both the similar players in juniors and we put some numbers up and we go to those camps and you either kind of fight or, or to get noticed or, or you score goals yeah. and I wasn't scoring any goals at those camps. They, they no, were good, was good players, good competition. So that was kind of after that it was like kind of in a sense that you're either going to have to do that to to become a player and get there. And we were both we both were grinding in that sense and had to do it the hard way moving up, but. Uh, that was that was a good experience uh, going to that uh, Traverse City tournament, though. That's for sure. It was. It was a cool experience. Yeah, there was a lot of a lot of fighters kind of go through that, and Boogeyman, and you know several others. David Kazoka, I remember. I think the one, one game I remember was against like Kovalchuk. That's how long ago it was when it was rookie year and how. It, and Danny Heatley, I believe too. Right? Were yeah. they not both out there? Yeah, they both were. Yeah. But, I'm like, wow, what, what world am I living in here? <laughs> right. I'm trying to learn, learn what I have to do to play in the NHL, and these guys are zipping by me, yeah. scoring scoring at will. But yeah. it was a pretty amazing experience for sure. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask you, though, Gratz, um, uh, you're, you're from Brantford, right? Yeah. 
Did you ever meet Walter, Walter Gretzky or Gretzky's? Yeah, daughter? I met him lots of times. He was always around the rink as, as a kid and whatever. And we, he would be golf tournaments, all his golf tournaments. And Wayne Gretzky took golf tournaments. He was always there too. So I met him quite a bit. And yeah, he was an assistant coach for my like minor hockey team the one year for a while. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Really? So, yeah. I figured I'd cross paths them at some point. Yeah, he's uh, he really them. was really well, uh, well, re- like well respected, obviously, and connected through the whole community in Brantford. So. It, yeah, that's what I heard. It was definitely disappointing and sad, sad loss yeah. for everybody there. He was a for great, sure. he was a great man. Yeah, that's what I heard. Sure. I, you keep hearing stories now that this that it happened. It's like you hear more and more positive stories, yeah. but I didn't realize how much of an impact he had on so many other hockey players outside of Wayne's and his, and yeah, his family. Yeah, he, he he would just be around the rink picking up pucks, like just just being a like a rink rat essentially. Just loved being around the kids and. And always smiling, taking pictures with the kids around Brantford. Uh, what was called the Gretzky Center is uh, is what their rink is. But he was always around and in the community, so he's uh, he's definitely going to be missed uh, around Brantford. That's for sure. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Tough. tough loss for sure. The world needs more people like that. Yeah, yeah I agree. Sure. Just a well, well-rounded, well-hearted, big-hearted guy. It was just a smile on his face all the time. So, I'm, yeah. Tough. Right on, brother. Well, again, we appreciate it. All right, boys. We'll get yeah, man. Tomorrow. We'll get gotta get, the, gotta get together, bro. Like, fucking yeah, too I'm, close. Yeah, yeah, too close, down. man. We'll be here in the next little while, for sure. Now that we're season. Yeah, let us know if you ever come down. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll set up uh, Nassie's little pod station there and yeah. do it face-to-face. It's always better. All right, boys. Yeah, Sit. a little more fun that way. But All right, boys. I appreciate yeah. it. All right. Thanks, Good bro. Time. That episode was brought to you by Settlemeyer Skate Sharpening. For the best skate sharpening in town and all your hockey needs, visit SettlemeyerSkateSharpening.com. And Body Check Wellness. For any CBD and functional mushroom products, we got you covered. Check out BodyCheckWellness.com. Wanted to thank our awesome guest, Josh Gratton. Really appreciate him coming on and sharing a little bit of his story and what he's up to now and some stories uh, throughout his hockey career. What a, what a beauty Gratz is. Nice to see him doing yeah. well. And uh, what, a, what, what a hell of a career, man, to, to, to slug it out the old-fashioned way and play around the world. And, he did. Man, props to him. He, he, he did, man. And, and, you know, like, you know, Riles, you played with him. He, I mean, he fuck he, I, I would love to know how many fights he's he's had oh like yeah, yeah i mean this guy he had a target on his back from when he came from the coast to the to the american league like we we talked about with him during the podcast but uh the the funniest thing to me was obviously we left out a few stories that you know he he said say whatever you want which i thought was hilarious because no one else has said that but yeah um the funniest thing to me is sitting there and He's really got himself together, man. I mean, this guy is coaching, running a whole program, and it, I just it makes you proud of the guy. Because if you had asked us back in <laughs> two thousand five, you think Gratz will ever run a team or you know be a coach? You'd be like, what? No, <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be lucky to be around, man, yeah. you know, in twenty twenty one. But no, nah, he's he's an awesome guy. He was an awesome teammate, awesome guy in the locker room, and funny guy. You know, he always. He always had us laughing. I mean, he was he was just a mess in a, in a good way. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. It's no. it's awesome to see him doing well. You know, he looks vibrant. He looks healthy. Um, like you yeah. said, like you know, back back you know, oh five, uh, the old grats. Like he like he said, you would never think that he could turn you know you know turn his life around the way he has. And right again, even extend his career. Sixteen years is a long time, even if you're a skill guy, let alone being a, a physical. Yeah legitimate fighter and you know again we talked about it there's no easy five minute majors for that guy i mean he earned no. he earned those minutes hard earned minutes um but you know the fact that he's able to kind of find you know that uh that thinking of staying on tip-top shape and you know later in his career to prolong his career was was a beautiful thing and um, the fact that he's able yeah. to kind of pull pull out of uh, some of that darkness he talked about um post retirement uh obviously is, is amazing um so uh, what a great teammate! Yeah, it was nice to reconnect with them because we haven't. Well, I haven't spoken with them for a while, so yeah. Yeah, it's it's sad, you know. It makes you sad when anyone goes through that, but especially when someone you know um, that he was having that tough of a time, man. Because you know, unfortunately, we've seen some guys take a way out, you know, that you, that you don't want. 
and uh, he didn't, thank God. And he looks great, man. Yeah, he, he, he really does. And he's another guy. Like I think everyone we talk to, we could we could probably spend three to four hours, you know, going over stories and stuff. But uh, really proud of him, man. And and uh, like you said, he it's a hard way to make a living. You know that. He did it for 16 years, and he took three to give one good one. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he really would, or, or, you know, one for one, but that's a hard way to <laughs> it's a hard way to go, man. Yeah, that's the truth, man. I've never seen a guy eat a punch like, like he has, and he did. <laughs> and not just, like, once in a while. It was, like you said, every night. It was <laughs> gobbling, was I mean, gobbling I, up punches like it was his dinner. Yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> But uh, awesome, awesome to see him, you know, pull out of it uh, on the right side of uh, right side of things. And uh, a lot of guys don't, yep. you know. I, I think this the, yeah. this type of conversation is is, uh, is is far too often ta- had and talked about. We had one with Bundy and right. you know, Friggy, and you know, it is it is it's, it seems to be overly common, unfortunately. So um, now he's yeah. doing some positive things with his platform, coaching, as well as helping some other hockey players out as well. So. Beautiful to see. Yeah. yeah, it is. It really is. So be sure to tune in next week for episode 14 of Nasty Knuckles. That's about it for tonight. Take care, knuckleheads, and check out nastyknuckles.com for all our new merch that's coming out and that sweet-ass jersey that Nasty's rocking. Oh, yeah. This, the reversible? Yes, they through are. Through the orange on. I'm not a big orange guy, but this is kind of... Looks good on you. Looks good on you, brother. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, bro. You don't have your glasses on, so it's tough to see. <laughs> I don't either. All right. See you, knuckleheads, man. Till next week, knuckleheads.